Welcome to Nick Talk, a show where we'll be telling you all about series from around the world. In our first segment, let's look at five reasons why the West Indies were successful against Sri Lanka in their T20 series. At number five, the domination of the West Indies openers. You look at Brandon King who scores 76 runs and his partner in crime, Lendl Simmons, also scoring 76 runs. Uh, you know, they really put the West Indies in good stead, built the foundation which is necessary and we had questions about Brandon King but he's slowly showing why he is the man uh, for the job. Both openers, you know, at least one of them lasting after the initial power play in both matches and that was a very encouraging sign for the West Indies. At number four, the resurgence and pace of O'Shane Thomas, who made his return to the West Indies team, taking six wickets in the series, three of them coming in one over in the first T20. He bowled with ferocity, with great pace, and you look at that channel which he bowled in outside the off stump, challenged the Sri Lankan batsman, and you, when you look at it, in terms of the West Indies side going to the World T20 in Australia, O'Shane Thomas could be that strike bowler for the West Indies. At number three, a lack of partnerships by the Sri Lankan batsmen caused them to not get momentum you know, in their innings. You, take, you look at the West Indies picking up wickets at regular intervals. Uh, the Sri Lankans only had one partnership over 50. That was De Silva and Pereira of 87. Whereas the West Indies had three partnerships over 50 and was a main reasoning behind the difference between the two sides when they went out to bat. At two, how can I forget? Andre Russell, they call him Dre Russ. The power hitting on display by Dre Russ took the game away from the Sri Lankans each and every time, finishing with a strike rate of over 267, and that's almost unheard of. You saw in the second T20, he took a liking to Lasith Malinga, uh, hitting six sixes in that game, uh, a knock of 40 in 14 balls. He is a destroyer in any league he goes to around the world, and Dre Russ is showing for the West Indies, he made such a difference with the bat, scoring 75 runs, and he's showing that the West Indies can be a dominant force in the World T20 coming up later in the year. At number one, the lack of consistency by the Sri Lankan bowlers caused them to never be able to get wickets at crucial intervals. The West Indies were able to form partnerships, build foundations. You saw the power hitting from Nicholas Puran. Kyron Pollard and Andrew Russell, uh, no Sri Lankan bowler was under the economy rate of seven and you know that that can never look good for your bowling attack. Um, you know they definitely have a lot of work to do uh, in terms of with the ball, the West Indies batsmen really had all answers for them and that was the reason why the West Indies were so dominant when they had the bat in hand. The Aussies were unsuccessful and beaten badly by the South Africans in the ODI series, whitewashed. Let's look at five reasons why the South Africans whitewashed the Aussies. At reason number five, Henrik Klassen scoring the most runs in the series, 242 runs, scoring 29% of the South Africans runs in that series. He was a step above the rest. You look at his shot play, you look at his innovation i found he was able to pick up on the short shorter deliveries quickly and capitalize on them and really the aussie bowlers had no answer for him he was able to stick in and you know allow the other batsmen to bat around him and really see south africa home in in all three games so henrik Klassen, you know one of the main reasons why the south africans won this series at four the south africans ability to string together crucial partnerships was the main reason why they were able to defeat Australia. They had seven partnerships over 50 and you know partnerships are always going to be crucial because it really takes the momentum away from the bowling side and the South Africans were able to you know consolidate when they lost the wicket and then you know put those runs on the board and that was mainly because of um, you know someone like a Henrik Klassen and, and Quinton de Kopp who batted very well throughout the series and uh, really set up the South Africans in terms of with the runs very nicely. At number three, the use of home advantage by the South Africans set them up beautifully. The South Africans used their home ground as a fortress. They are, some would say, unbeatable at home 
and you look at the last six meetings between the two sides, Australia and South Africa, and South Africans have won all six. So uh, really, there was no great surprise that they did come out victors, uh, you know, in this series. But uh, you have to give them credit because the Australians were playing some good uh, cricket, and they were a tough side to beat. Reason number two: the depth of the South African seamers. You look at where they bowled in this series in that channel outside the off stump. At times, they put the Australian batsmen in two minds. They weren't sure if to go forward or go back. The ball was on a good length and was moving. And uh, of course, the attack spearheaded by Lungi and Gidi. But the fact is that he was dropped in the third ODI, you know, for rotation purposes. And the South Africans were still able to restrict the Australians to only a, a smear over 250 runs, which shows that there's a lot of depth in that. Uh, seam attack and they were able to pick up wickets at regular intervals uh, you know you look at the lines that they were bowling challenge the Australian batsmen and it's very good uh, to know when you can have five uh, out and out aggressive seamers so very good for South Africa that they were able you know to string together these five pacers and get wickets and the last but not least Lungi Ngidi the spearhead of the South African attack uh, you look at his ability to penetrate uh, through the Australian body lineup, uh, able to pick up wickets in crucial intervals. And what I was most impressed with was his ability to change his pace at the depth. He's showing that he can bowl early on in the innings when he dismissed David Warner twice in both matches for 35 and 25 when Warner was getting a start and, you know, get his eye in and was looking for a big score. And Gidi was always able to come on with the ball and take that crucial wicket. And then, of course, at the depth, restricting um, the Australian batsman and of course he took six in that second ODI so very impressed with Lungi Ngidi as he makes his mark for one of the best bowlers in the world going around right now. The South Africans will visit India in a battle of supremacy when that series begins on March 12th. Let's look at five things to look out for when the two sides meet each other. At number five, the recovery of the injured. The Indians will welcome the additions of three uh, of their resident players in Bhavaneshwar Kumar, Shekhar Dawan and Hardik Pandya who will be returning to the side uh, after missing out on the series in New Zealand. Um, you know, and I look at Shekhar Dawan especially for this ODA series, he's gonna be a welcome addition because um, you know, Mike Agarwal and Prithvi Shaw struggled in New Zealand. Uh, they did not last more than eight overs batting together as a pair. So Shaker Down will definitely bring solidity at the top of the order uh, for the Indians. So uh, we will have to see how that one goes. And looking at the others, Bhavaneshwar Kumar, in terms of his seam bowling and his movement of the ball, will trouble the South Africans. Uh, we know how attacking he can be. And for Hardik Pandya, registering scores of 46, 105, 38, and 158 not out in the DY Patel Invitational T20 Tournament back home in India, he's showing that he's ready to come back into the side in an explosive fashion. At number four, how will the Indians face the seam attack of the South Africans who just did so well against Australia? Uh, the Indians struggling against the pace in New Zealand, losing 18 of their 19 wickets uh, against the New Zealand Seamers. Kyle Jameson uh, was definitely one that caused a lot of doubt in that Indian body lineup. And of course, with Lungi and Giri, who's, you know, chomping at the bits, how will they respond and react to him? Uh, can they get through him, especially in those openers? Because we know that's when he likes to be so aggressive and attacking uh, at the top of the innings. So if the Indians can get through the seam attack of South Africa, they could be looking at 300 plus scores very consistently. At number three, how will Virat Kohli respond? After a tough series in New Zealand, scoring 75 runs in three matches in the One Day International Series and 38 runs in four matches in the test series. He's had a torrid time out there, but uh, of course he's returning to his home ground where he averages 64 in ODIs of 2020. And he scored 1,287 runs against South Africa throughout his career. So that is another uh, main factor. I am expecting Kohli to come back with a bye. We know he's that sort of big match player. So let's see how he will react. At number two, how will Henrik Klassen bat in Indian conditions? He's only played India in one day internationals 
once in his career. He averages 36 against them, but he's never made that treacherous trip to India. We know that those wickets, you know, they spin a lot. And let's see if Klassen, who is usually a good player of spin, if he's able to navigate, you know, the likes of Chahal um, when they do face the Indians, because it's going to be tough. But if he is able to do that, he can score, as we know, uh, coming off of that Australia series where he scored 242 runs. We know he's a very good player of pace. So let's see if he can get to the spinners and then able to score off the Pacers. And finally, how will the South Africans continue to adapt without their lead strike bowler in Kaigiso Rabada? We saw against Australia, he was not there due to his injury, but Lungi Ngiti picked up the slap, was able to take wickets at crucial times and against Australia, uh, the South Africans, the Pacers especially, picking up 18 wickets, so they did a very good job. Um, you know, the likes of North J, uh, Ngiri, Falfa Kwayo. So they've, they've done a very good job against Australia. But now when they go to play India in a place where seam bowling is a bit tougher, conditions don't necessarily favor the seam bowlers. How would they, uh, you know, in terms of the bowlers, how would they bowl? I'm expecting them, um, you know, to do very well in India because of the raw pace of North J and Ngiri. So that's something to look out for in terms of the seamers and their impact on the series when they go to India. For the first ODI, I'm predicting the Indians who had a tough period against New Zealand to bounce back strong and take the first ODI. It's going to be, you know, a tough time for so that for to adapt to the conditions, but it's going to be a close series, but India will win the first ODI. That brings us to the end of the first episode. Thank you very much for watching. And for more content, you can check us out on our social media pages at NickTov or click the link in the description for more information.